Welcome to the inaugural Albany Film Festival of the New York State Writers Institute here at the University at Albany. I'm Mark Koplick, Assistant Director. With us today is one of our favorite previous visitors, director and screenwriter, Darnell Martin. We're pleased to bestow on her one of our very first Ironweed Awards for Achievement in Film. We gave our first Ironweed Award in person to Francis Ford Coppola in the fall of 2019. We'd been looking forward to honoring Darnell Martin in person at our first Albany Film Festival last year before the pandemic shut us down. Ms. Martin last visited us in January 2016 at a screening of her film, Their Eyes Were Watching God, an adaptation of Zora Neale Hurston's landmark novel starring Halle Berry and presented by Oprah Winfrey. She shared the stage with Harlem Renaissance scholar Emily Bernard. We had a packed audience in Page Hall full of students and community members, including a Girl Scout troop, a crew of students from the urban film program Youth FX, and a large contingent of sisters from Zora Neale Hurston's own sorority, Zeta Phi Beta. After the screening of that powerful and breathtakingly beautiful film, Their Eyes Were Watching God, there was a great outpouring of love from the audience. The selfies and group photos and intergenerational conversations went on for at least an hour. We're sorry we're not able to recreate that experience online, but whatever you're doing right now, please give a standing ovation for Darnell Martin. It's great to see you again. <laughs> that was like, whoa, that was incredible. Thank you for that. <laughs> it was very, very good. So, so more and more you, you've been embraced as a historic figure, a trailblazer, the first black woman to direct a, major, a, a film for a major Hollywood studio. How do you feel about that kind of thing? Well, I'm actually the first African-American woman. Right. Halsey um, did Dry White Season. And that always made me feel like I never wanted to take anything away from her. So when, you know, everybody is saying, oh, you're the first African-American woman to direct a major studio film. It was like, yeah, but don't like, you're taking that away from Zan Palsy. And I love Dry White Season, great film, amazing film. So I don't want, never wanted to take anything away from that sister. But I am the first African American because she was an American. So. <laughs> and it, did, did it, at the time, did it feel like you were blazing a path or not at all? Um, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I have to say, because it should have happened sooner. It's, you know, it's like, when, you know, um, it's interesting because actually uh, 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 um, uh, it, it, you know, our, to see our voices and to see our stories, um, I didn't always grow up with that. You know, it was very rare that you got to see that, you know, like yourself. Um, uh, on screen or just where you came from in a way. And, you know, now I'm going to really date myself. Although I loved, um, Julia, you know, the, the film, the television show about the nurse loved it, loved it, loved it. That was not my reality. You know, I grew up in the hood and, um, you know, um, so to bring, um, you know, my first film, you know, I like it like that, uh, to, to do that film, that was really so much of how I grew up, my story. Like it was on the same block that I grew up on, you know, just like, you know, production design of it. It was like so specific because it was so much of my memories, um, you know, and, and you know, it, it's interesting because just like, just in production design, seeing like places like to go, that's what my living room looked like, or that's what my kitchen looked like, or, you know, like growing up and like seeing just what was on TV or what was in the movies. And we didn't even own a TV. It was like every once in a while we got to 
to my grandmothers or my aunts or uncles and you know um you know seeing tv there um it was not my reality you know it was like the tide commercials i never had you know we didn't have a kitchen that looked like that or opening a refrigerator and seeing all that food inside it was a very different so it wasn't it wasn't just the African American experience because that can also be a um, uh, a middle class experience as well, you know what I mean, or an upper middle class experience. But it was also um, a a class experience that wasn't seen um, that I couldn't see when I was a kid growing up. It was like I didn't exist, and people who lived in the situation that I lived did not exist. Um, and if anyone was uh, struggling in, 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 you know, in poverty or um, in certain situations, and if there was any kind of um, crime or violence, people were not um, seen as people, but they were seen as stereotypes of those um, uh, of the criminal behavior, you know what I mean. So, um, so I think that was really, uh, you know, for you know, for me, that was something that that I was trying to 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 kind of just put what I saw, what my life, what was surrounding. Um, you know, me coming up a lot, you know, and, and then, you know, and I, and I think a lot of us were, there were other people, you know, coming out with, okay, this is my reality. Um, or this is how, like, nostalgia, right? What is nostalgia? You know, I don't live in the Bronx anymore. <laughs> but there is a nostalgia when I think about, you know, when I, when, when I am in the Bronx, there is a beauty to it that I see that is um, phenomenal, um, and uh, and the kind of sublime sub, sublime beauty in in a lot of um, in, in memory, and how that kind of uh, built me and made me see people that people aren't. Just that there's more, way, way, way more to to everyone than than what you imagine their job or their situation. You know, there is, um, you know, they're just um, great spiritual leaders and 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 and. Um, and warriors in in these broken neighborhoods, you know. So you, you point out how um, you know out, outrageous and, and and sad it is that these these milestones um, in uh, cinema for uh, African Americans for people of color uh, that that they've come you know so late that they're all so recent. I mean, uh, uh, um, I like it like that it was 1994, right? And, uh, um, you know, Halle Berry wins, you know, Best Actress in 2002, I guess, and, and Spike Lee is, is 1989, uh, Do the Right Thing. Um, so do you think it's getting any easier now or not? Um. Uh, I, the answer is I should say yes, right? But I don't. Um, because I think um, I think what stops what stops police brutality and what stops racism is an awareness of our history and. A, there's two things I'm very afraid of right now. 
One is I'm really, really, really terrified for all of these kids who from uh, preschool to uh, last year of high school, who schooling has stopped because of the pandemic. And I'm very concerned about the marginalized kids whose school was a safe haven. So it's like, okay, so what's happening? So with, with those kids, they're going to be led right into the prison system because they're being pushed out of school. So that's one of my big, 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 huge fears. The second fear, and I think it, it, it's, it's, they're connected. Um, and there's, those are basically gonna be a lot of kids of color. Um, the second fear that I have, and, and something needs to be done about that immediately, like right now, we need to like grab those kids and like, and help them. And number two, what I'm really concerned about is um, police brutality and racism and where we're going now, because it seems we're not really going forward. Some of us are going forward and going, oh yeah, that's really terrible. We understand it now because there's all these videos that people can watch. There's nothing new, it's always been there. It's always been the same, um, but we're actually not really dealing with it. And I think the way that you have to deal with it and has to be dealt with very quickly is you have to re-educate people about our history. No one really, really wants to do that because it's a lot of history. We have to attack this the way that after the Holocaust in Germany, Nazism was attacked. We have to attack it with that kind of fervor. We have to talk about, you know, people go, oh yeah, there was the Tulsa massacre, there was Rosewood. No, it wasn't just those two massacres. It was endless massacres, endless, endless. You had Georgia, you had uh, 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 Arkansas, you had uh, North Carolina, Wilmington, you had all the massacres in 1990. Yeah, there's tons of massacres. Um, so when you look at that and you understand you know, like what the police department was and how it was created through the, um, you know, Sons of the Confederacy, how uh, uh, education and history was recreated by the daughters of the Confederacy that they actually cre ripped through history books and said, we're not talking about that. And, and these lies, these lies that have been taught. Now, if we said things have changed, there'd be this huge, huge push to say, we are going to do historical dramas about the real American history, what really happened, because we've been lying to white people and black people, Native American people as well, everyone for this long. And what it's done is it's created a sense where literally you know, immigrants can come over from other countries and say, hey, why didn't you black people get it together yet? You know, we've just been here like, you know, a hundred years and we're great, what happened to you? And it's like, you need to see what happened because we were there and then it all got burnt down. And then we were there and it all got burnt down. We have to understand the attack on reconstruction and it didn't just stop then but continually. So when we wanna tell those stories and those are easy stories to tell, yeah, then maybe I'd say, yeah, we've really come a long way, but they're not. Nobody wants to tell those stories. And that's the truth. Nobody wants to tell the truth because the response to that is, and we're the good white people. Could we see them in this, you know? <laughs> um, and there's some great white people, the John Brown, you know, I just did uh, that uh, John Brown with, with Ethan Hawke and that was amazing, you know, but it's, it's, there's not a whole lot of John Browns, unfortunately, in our history. Um, and, you know, so literally I'm not seeing the historical dramas that need to be made. Um, you know, what I'm hearing, oh, that costs so much, that's big, you know, you know. And that's, that, that's a big problem for me because I don't see, I mean, there is this lie 
about African Americans. And there is a way that we are seen historically and it's fed to our children. You know, where are the black brave hearts? We have them. They're not there. They're not there in cinema. They're not there. Nobody wants to make those stories. So until, until people want to make those stories, until John Brown becomes the messiah for white Americans, black lives will never matter in America. You, you tell one of the great uh, American historical stories in, in Cadillac Records, the rise of Chicago blues and the birth of, of rock and roll. And of, of course you help bring one of the great classics of American literature to the screen, their eyes were watching God. Should students in, in history classes and literature classes be on the lookout for, for great stories that haven't been told yet on the screen? Should, should they be reading and studying with an eye to uh, bringing this project to fruition that, that you suggest? Yeah, that would be amazing. I, we could not, there's not enough. There's so many stories. There's so many stories. We have to unfortunately like scrounge for them, really, really look for them because they're not out there um, so easily uh, accessible. But there's, you know, I, I trip over the, the amazing stories to tell. You know, I have a dream that, you know, I, I would like to do an American history uh, Game of Thrones style. You know what I mean? Where you just set up all these and say, you wanna see how America was made? Well, this is how it was made. I mean, you know, there's, a, there's an interesting thing that happens and it happens all the time, um, continually. You know, people say conspiracy. I don't say conspiracy. What I say instead is patterns. There's patterns, you know, like uh, uh, right before the Tulsa mass massacre, after World War One, what did you have? Well, actually, even before World War One, you had socialists and unionists and African Americans and poor white people, poor agrarians, getting together and creating a new party that was very dangerous to the people in charge because they needed that racism between poor whites and African-Americans, just as we're seeing right now. And then you had the, uh, you know, the fusionists even before that during the reconstruction where fusion, fusionists and, and um, when the Republican party was the party of Lincoln, you had the uh, uh, Republicans and the fusionist, fusionists and, and um, the African-Americans creating that party. It, again, poor whites and creating the fusionist party, which was, okay, we're going to all vote for our interests. You know, that was destroyed. Now where we are, we're somewhere like that again with, um, you know, this idea of social, you know, social de Democrats and Bernie and, you know, Bernie Sanders and so forth. Um, and we just get to this one place of like really coming together as a group of people and not seeing, you know, color or 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 gender and saying we're just all people not voting against our interests to survive, you know, and unions and so forth. And and then it gets the big bowling ball that comes to break it apart, as we're seeing, you know, with what happened at the Capitol is, you know, this kind of uneducated white supremacy that imagines, imagines that um, someone of color or, uh, or, or, or um, a woman or what, whatever can take something away from them. And it's not actually, you know, the guy who wants to destroy their union. <laughs> So it, it, it's, it's, you know, it's a, it's a continual, it's just, it's shocking to me. Like if you really like study history, you just see over and over and over and over again. And until we make that story sexy and show it and, and make people aware, like I think, you know, like it'd be cool if you just like did this whole Game of Thrones kind of, kind of version of that. 
um, but people aren't interested in telling it. It's in 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 telling a story, a real story about let let's really understand racism, and let's really understand how far we've come as African as as a people, African Americans, and what keeps trying to crush us down over and over and over and over again. You know, our children need to see that because literally I've, I've seen so many people they are like, well, why haven't you guys gotten your shit together? And it's like, we did. And then, you know, North Carolina happened, Wilmington, we did. And then the massacres of 99 happened, 1919 happened and Tulsa massacre, we did. And, you know, it's just continual. The Rockefeller drug laws, laws, we did, and redlining, we did, and, but it's it's not. It's almost like the intelligentsia understands this, but we need to make it accessible in a cinematic way that we're not preaching to the converted. You know, that because it's like, how do you fix? like hundreds of years of lies. How do you do that? And if we're not even making an attempt to do that, right? As, as, as producers, you know, if we're not even making an attempt to do that, how will it change anything? There are people who did not see George Floyd as human. And that's why that happened. That's why he was murdered so viciously. If George Floyd had been a few shades lighter and his hair had less of a curl to it, that never would have happened. And that happened because of the story being told. The story that's been told for hundreds and hundreds of years. And now that there is no rush to say, we need to say that that history is not true, that we've been teaching you for years. That there is no absolute, like, oh my God, we need to rush and do this. <laughs> I don't see a change. Think, thinking of the young people who may be watching this at home or in, in classrooms, um, what do you wish you knew early in your film career? I wish that I 100, and this is a hard thing, I guess. I wish that I knew how important my voice was and I didn't doubt myself at all or think that anyone else could have a better way of telling my story. Now, having said that, I also wish that I had a stronger sense of, of humility in listening in listening to humans now when i say listening i don't mean doing what someone said just listening so as an artist we need to, this is the hard part. We need to be really sure of, of ourselves and our, and, and, our, and our vision and what we want to do and, and not be like, ooh, I'm not sure if I have a right to say this or if I'm really smart, fuck that. But we also have to really listen. And when people say, oh, you're not listening to me. It's like, no, no, I say now I'm listening to you. I don't agree with you, but I'm listening. So 
we have to listen because we're human and we experience the same human feelings. So as a director or as a writer, I need to listen and try to hear you and understand you and be you in a weird way. And then I can say, well, I, I agree with it or I don't agree with it. But as an artist, I need to listen because if I do, I'll get a greater understanding of the whole picture. Now in listening to you, I don't negate myself. I guess that's it. I guess that, and that's a, that's a hard thing. Like as, as a director now, I mean, my best tools in directing actors and I think I'm actually, um, that that probably is my forte, um, directing actors is that I listen and I watch, I have an idea of what I, what I want in the scene, what I expect from the scene. And then I watch this thing, these words, the situation, the atmosphere, go through, penetrate this human being and then words and movement come out of the actor. And I watch. And sometimes they'll say to me, well, what do you think? I'll say, let me just watch. Let me see what's happening. Let me see, because the great thing is they're gonna bring something to it that I haven't thought of. You try to think of everything, right? But then you're not them. And their experience is another like kind of magic chemical. And then their experience with the other actor creates another kind of magic chemical, right? And you, you listen, you, you watch and you listen intently and then you find something. You find an understanding, something that moves within you that's connected to, the, to them. And you go, oh, okay, now I see this other thing. Hmm, imagine that the moment would be like this. Well, then in that case, if the moment is like this, maybe I don't want to dolly. Maybe I don't want to move. Maybe I just want to sit here. Or maybe if it is like this, maybe it's so powerful, I want to back away and crane up or, you know, so it, it I just think that's just a directorial thing about, you know, about actors, but I think that's with everything. If you're an artist, you have to see everything and be quiet and and listen and really see and really look. And But in doing that, you also have to trust your own interpretation and then be willing in one instant to change everything that you ever believed if something changes your, your mind and go, well, we were going in that direction, now we're gonna go in that direction because that is the better way to go. You know, I mean, someone asked me recently on a shoot, why, why do you wanna do this? They just made it a whole, a whole lot easier for you because, you know, there was an issue and it was, you know, the whole pandemic and da 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 da. And so the writers kindly rewrote something. And I said, but the first thing they wrote was better. So why do we want to do the other thing? And it's like, well, because it's going to be like almost impossible. I said, well, let's try. Let's try to get the right thing, right? Let's try to, we should always strive for what is the best way we can have a, a, an easy answer in our back pocket, but let's strive for the closest thing to truth. Why not, you know? And then if we can't, we can't, but we strive for it. And in, in most cases we can, can. In, in, the, in the course of this conversation, um, you, you've 
discuss something that we've been discussing here a lot lately, which is, you know, how we need empathy in order to make the world a better place. And you're also talking about how we need empathy to make great art. And, I, you know, I, I appreciate your, your making that connection. I, I don't think that that the relationship between those two things, making the world a better place and, and, and creating great art all kind of connected to this, this very, um, you know, uh, uh, sincere and, and concentrated effort of empathy, um, you know, how those things are connected. So I re re really appreciate your kind of br bringing those, those two things together in the, in the same conversation. Well, if I don't understand you, how can I tell your story? And if I don't understand you, how can I direct you? You know, and many times I'm sitting in a situation where I'm like, I don't understand these characters. I don't understand because I don't write everything I direct. I don't understand this scene. And I sit there and I watch, you know, I'll read it, I'll read it, da, 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 but there's something. And then I'll see the actors and I'm watching and I'm watching and I'm watching. I'm like, ah, okay, that I understand. That moment right there, I understand. Let's start to work off of that, right? And when I say understand, I mean understand that I have felt that I could be that, you know? Not just understand. Like, you know, people say, what do you mean you don't understand? And it's really clear. And I'm like, I'm not talking about understanding it intellectually, of course. Yes, you can easily, I'm talking about yeah, exactly. Empathy. Yeah, I think. W would you encourage young people to pursue a career in film and, and television? Um, I, think I, I literally encourage young people to pursue a career in, in whatever, you know, like knocks their boots off really <laughs> you know not particularly I, I think if you want to do it because it seems glamorous to you and cool I don't think that then you if that's the reason that's not why you should do it um but if it's something you know I can't not write and um and I'm fascinated by behavior and I'm fascinated in um, in humans, you know, and 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 I, I guess love. And what I mean, love is, I think that's what all drama is for me. I think love of something, right? Fighting for love, fighting for love of something. And sometimes it's a bad love, fighting for, you know, the love of, of, of wanting to possess, right? Some, you know, possession, you know, but it's always like if that, that interests me because if, if you're a storyteller and you could be a writer, you know, you, you don't have to be a filmmaker to be a storyteller. You know, you could be a, a novelist or a poet or, yeah, I mean, I think that's, to me, it, that's exciting for me because, you know, I, I want to understand life and, and through drama. Like, you know, I hope that when I do certain, and it's not all the time, but it, it's great when you feel that way, when you, when you work through a scene or, or write something, and then you go, let me just turn this last part. And then you say, um, wow, I kind of figured something out about um about life or about myself. I really like that. Like that's what I think this should be about. Art should be about is just trying to figure out trying to figure trying to figure out stuff about this whole drama that we're living in, you know. And what it means. We we got into um, the art of film through writing. We're a lit literary arts organization, and uh, you wrote "I Like It Like That." You wrote Cadillac Records. You co-wrote "Prison Song" with with the hip hop artist Q-Tip. Why is writing important to film? 
Um, well, first of all, I want to say I meet so many filmmakers who say, yeah, I'm not a writer. And I'm like, are you a talker? <laughs> like, what do you mean you're not a writer? Do you, you, can you tell me a story? Yeah. Well, then if you can tell me a story, you're a writer. The problem is you had a very, very bad English teacher in your life who told you that you couldn't write. I think that everyone is a writer. And I have a lot of writer friends who would be horrified at me for saying that. And I think Faulkner kind of agreed with that. You know, Faulkner said he used to think that people were born with talent. And then he just realized that if you write enough, you can actually become talented at writing, even if you're not in the beginning. And I, I, I think that, you know, I mean, there are amazing comedians who do stand up and tell these phenomenal stories. And you're right there on the edge of your seat. And it's like, you want to tell me that they're not great writers and that somebody in some school and some class didn't just fuck it up for them, you know? And it's just like, so I think, I think writing is so important. That, that's what I would tell people to be, to be writers. I think everyone is a writer because being a writer says that the way you see things is not only valid, but it's important because it's, it's important for people to understand life, to be able to look at the way you see things too. Certain people who have degrees and all of you know uh, these accolades and are allowed to be writers, no, it just should not be their fucking view of the world. You know, everybody has a story. And there are no elite groups who get to put that story on screen or in books. The problem is there is one problem. There is an amount of discipline. There are hours that need to be spent writing. And, you know, there's that great quote, I'm sure, I don't remember who, who said it. But, you know, I hate writing, but I love having written. It's horrible. You're, in, you're by yourself, you're alone, and you're writing. And when it's good, it's so good. But then when you get stumped and you're like, ah, I don't know how to do this, it's horrible. And then we say we have writer's block and so, so forth. And the best way to cure writer's block is to take your favorite book and retype one page, your favorite page, over and over again until the writer's block stops. And it will. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, everybody should be a writer for sure. I don't know if that makes you a poet, a screenwriter, a novelist, but yeah, you know, you sh how you see things, it's very important. And I'm interested, you know. So you, you, you bring up Faulkner, how about reading? How important is reading books for the personal growth of a, of a young filmmaker? Reading is amazing. Um, you know, what's funny is, um, uh, I read a lot. <laughs> That's just my question. But it, the, the thing is, I don't, I'm not reading what I want to read all the time. Like I want to just pick up a novel and read a novel. I have not had the opportunity to do that. Unfortunately, I hate to say that in years, a lot of what I read is, um, is histories, our histories. And I read a lot of papers on the internet as well. Like, you know, just papers on stuff that because like a lot of um, other things that I'm interested in and when we talk about history again, the history that's hard to find, it's not always in books. A lot of times it's like people's thesis papers, you know? So, you know, I'll, I, I read a lot of history is, is what I read or I read some science, um, but I, I find that I'm not reading a lot for fun and that's unfortunate. Um, sometimes I'll force myself to read some poetry because when you read poetry, there's, it's, it's almost like meditating in the sense of you can't hope to, this is a terrible, but it's a terrible thing to say, but you can't help to, um, 
to gain something from it as a writer. Like, oh, I need to read this because perhaps I'll see something that'll help me understand something in a character. You know what I mean? It's just, you, you just do it to do it and it opens up something else inside you unexpected. So, um, so sometimes, and, and that I find really wonderful to just like force myself to, to, to read some poetry. Um, because it doesn't feel like, you know, I'm always feeling like everything I have to do has to be towards something. But, you know, cause there's so little time in the world and there's so, you know, I'm doing so much, but um, I read a lot of scripts, um, but yeah, reading, reading is, it's amazing because you see a lot of story structure and, and sometimes not even story structure, but character. Um, you know, I remember reading Light in August by Faulkner. I think I was 17. And I realized that that oddly made me a filmmaker because there was a moment where this guy, Joe Christmas goes outside and he's outside in the field and it's night and he flicks this match or it's a cigarette, but I can't remember. And he flicks it out into the field and he waits and it's so quiet and he's trying to hear it fall. And I could just see that image. And it's, it's you know, it was, it was a very uh, visceral book for me where I literally saw everything. Maybe it was the first book and I'm not from there. I don't know anything about the country. You know, <laughs> I grew up in the Bronx, but um, it was like, so the words he really created a place that I could see. And it was odd that it made, that that was kind of the book that made me really want to be um, a filmmaker. There, there are so many things I'd like to ask you, but we're, we're, we're coming up on time. I, we, we, we like to end these on kind of a, a hopeful, inspirational note. And, and you, already, you already touched on this, but I, I'm gonna ask you about it again. Um, in, Ideal circumstances, can, can films make the world a better place? Can they, can they change the world? Oh my God, yeah, films, films totally can change the world. And um, I guess the ideal, you know what we need? I'll tell you what we need. We need filmmakers and we need voices and we need our history um, exposed you know, and we need our brave hearts. But if you really feel like, you know what? I'm not a writer, I'm, I, I can't sit down. I, I think everyone's a writer, but I can't, I, I can't sit down and do it. Um, but I really wanna be part of that. Then I would say, then be a producer. Then find the means to, to, to put that together find the story and find the means or just find the means and you will find people. And then, then you'll have, you know, then you can find the story. Um, you know, in film, you have producers, you have writers, you have, you have DPs, you know, uh, 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 who photograph these amazing images, um, you know, photograph it. Um, you know, we, we have, being a filmmaker is so vast because there's, we need to get these stories out and we need to get, and the main story is this, we're all one, we're all people and we're destroying ourselves and we're destroying the world. And because of our supposed differences. And every, like even a really simple film that doesn't feel like it has anything to do with politics or race, sometimes just the simplicity of, um, of, of recognizing that someone is so much like you even though they look so different, they speak a different language, 
they have a different religion. That is, is um, groundbreaking right there. If you can take a character who has a different religion, looks completely different, different gender, different everything, so different on every level from you on the outside, and then make people understand that character and say, that's me. I felt that way. I've gone through that. Now you're beginning to end sexism. Now you're beginning to end racism just in that moment. Like, you know, right now I'm doing a lot of television. And one thing that I say is I, I work on this show, New Amsterdam. And, you know, sometimes I'll tell the actors, I'll be like, you know, so here's this monologue you have that is, is, is kind of incredible and, 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 and could be offensive to some people that, um, you know, that, you know, in, in different areas, but what, and they would never go and see this or you, but because you're on this television show on NBC, it goes into their house and they are forced to deal with you. If they want to see the other people on the show, they're forced to deal with you. And they're kind of forced to hear this moment of what you say. Yes, they could turn it off. They can go into the kitchen, but we have this opportunity for them to see that you are not different from who they are in some very basic human ways and to connect with you. And once people start connecting, other things start to fall away. So it's, it's interesting. I feel like with a film, if I, you know, a film, people make that decision of whether we're going to go see it. Television, especially network television, there's stuff that are, that's brought into people's homes that exposes them to things that they would never, ever even want to be exposed to. And if we handle that in a smart and um, human way, then television could possibly be one of the best educators. I mean, we've seen it with how it's the worst educator, right? We've seen it with this, these horrible, some of these really horrible reality shows, you know, um, you're fired, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> how horrible is that? We want to watch a show about people being fired by a racist lunatic. <laughs> so the thing is, is that it, that affected a lot of America. It really did. It said, oh, I am that guy and this is a valid behavior. So, you know, um, I mean, God, Mr. Rogers said it best, huh? You know, look for the helpers. And um, there's helpers in the worst the worst and raw situations. So, um, yeah, I think it's I think it's very powerful. And in an odd way, I think television is probably the the most powerful. And I go back to Julia, dating myself once again. That African American nurse who lived in a really great apartment and was a great mom to her son and just a great human being, and seeing her was um was a great thing in the Cosby show, you know? And um yeah, those were, you know, and and right now blackish. I think blackish is really, you know, ground. Um yeah, I, I oddly think that television kind of has more power because like you choose to go out and see a film. Unless you, you know, yeah, that's. Darnell Martin, it's, it's always great to, to speak with you. And we want to bring you here in person as soon as that's possible. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I am there. Thank you so much for everything you do. You, um, you have great programs there. I remember um, being so impressed with um, the students who came, the people that I talked to. Um, it was an amazing event. So I really hope to be able to get there soon. So. To, our, to our audience, please visit albanyfilmfestival.org for a wide range of offerings online and a couple in person. Uh, we, we'll also have links to where you can watch films by our guests online. Most of this year's festival will be virtual, but we're also planning a couple of bold, unusual in-person events. These will be safe and socially distanced outdoor events in late April and early May. Check out albanyfilmfestival.org for details. If you wish to support future programming like this, feel free to make a donation at our website. Thanks so much for tuning in. Be well, be safe.